ladies and gentlemen, uh, I have decided to speak on something very different because it's election times and most people expect a politician is going to talk politics. But I've chosen to speak on nurturing environment and how we as Indians have a deep, deep sense of ecology which the world needs to learn from us. Unfortunately, the path we have trodden all these years is taking us away from the basic sense which our ancient wisdom had and we have chosen to move away from that path. So the latest use of words like deep ecology, which has recently been discovered by somebody like Ani Ness, people from Norway, people from all over the world, James Lovelock, these are the people who are talking about deep ecology. And because I am amongst the students who are studying science most of the time, and these scientists think environment is completely different from spirit spirituality, and it is something which is a physical existence. So I want to take you back to the ancient wisdom of this country. Ancient wisdom where today's challenges of climate change, today's challenges of wasting a nation by pollution are all based in our ancient wisdom. And when we think of deep ecology, when we think of ecology even as a subject, ecology in the Western world, in the Western academia, is a recent uh, discovery where ecology as a subject, and the world was discovered only in 1866, and by uh, a scientist where they talked about the relationship between living beings with their environment around. But if we go deep, deep, deep in our philosophy and our suktas, our hymns, our verses, then 2000 plus years ago, we had Rig Veda and 1028 hymns. Every hymn is related to environment. Symbolism is used for protecting the environment. Symbolism is used that a deeper sense of humanity can only sustain itself once we are connected to the one which is all pervading. And thousand years later, from that point in time, 3,000 plus years, 1,000 years later, we've had something like Atharved, the entire doctrine of Atharved is about environment. And it is in those words, that sense, which I want to speak about. What is my connection with the earth? What is our connection with the trees? What is our connection with the rivers, with the mountains, with the soil, with the preservation of this entire nature? When we talk about something like Atharved. The Atharved has a hymn called Bhumi Sukta. And Bhumi Sukta has about 63 verses. And each verse relates to that aspect that this earth is not only meant for human beings. This earth is meant for everything around, the birds, the animals, the mountains, the rivers. So we need to protect all this. And what holds the earth together? What holds the earth together is the feeling of nurturing it. What holds the earth together is every being. So once you raise a plow on the heart of the earth, then it is your duty to give it back to what you have taken away from the soil. The fertility of the soil is what keeps us nurtured. Fertility of the soil is what sustains our life form. And for this life form, the, all the technologies that we are using, all the pollution that we are causing, all the animals which we are killing, all the plants that we are killing, all the trees that we are cutting, we are actually harming the mankind. Because all this is needed to protect the mankind itself, to sustain the human life. So no matter how much of SDGs United Nations chooses to write, no matter how much of UNEP tries to work towards environment, all these multi-crore businesses are a waste, a waste of resource. Because till the spirituality is from within us, 
till we feel as one part of the environment, all this sustenance will not happen. If we compare the philosophies, if we compare the science with the thought, for the Western world, environment, ecology is science. But for the Indian ethos, the Indic philosophy, Indic thinking, it is the religion. And the religion which needs to be followed, a religion which is mandatory. And that mandatory aspect is that once you deal with earth, earth is my mother, I am her son, water should not be polluted, the mountains should not be degraded, the forests need to be preserved, and this is my duty towards the earth as a child to the mother. Interestingly, no other philosophy, no Abrahamic religion teaches us that. Nowhere do we mention that aspect in any other ancient philosophies of the world where they have dealt with the human is the supreme most force in the world and it is the mankind which needs to exploit the nature. Whereas in this philosophy, it is not the exploitative mechanism which we need to work because we are going to be sustainable, we are going to sustain the environment only and only if we are related to the one. And because we are related to the one, I call it punch dhatu panch bhumi, whatever with different names. So when we look at, say, my body, your body, any of us, when we die, what happens? Earth accepts us all. The wise ones, the foolish ones, the decent ones, the indecent ones, everyone gets accepted by the same mother earth, which has made our body. And if scientifically looking at it, what is it that we are made up of? Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. And that carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, calcium, phosphorus goes back to the same earth and brings us back again in various forms. These are the trees which nurture us, which feed us. These are the birds which sustain the earth. And this entire cyclic format where life, death and rebirth is what we believe in. And when we talk about an existence of a mankind, Existence of a mankind has been dealt with as soul, which is Purush, Purusharth, and the energy, which is the Prakriti. So the two forces have to be together to sustain mankind. And it is the mankind's responsibility to sustain the entire universe. And from Pind to Brahman, Pind to Brahmand is what we believe in. Kankan me Ram is what the Tulsidas says. That means every small element, every small speck of dust has the infinite force in itself. And that infinity is what has created mankind. And that infinity is what has created forest. That infinity has created soil. That infinity has created animals. And it's our duty to sustain all that. And because it is our duty to sustain all that, because we are the children of the very soil. We are made from it. We are part of the earth and earth is part of us. And when we sustain the environment, can only then the world will go on. The biggest threat the world is faced with today, the biggest threat the globe is faced with today, the biggest threat humankind is faced with today is climate change. And climate change comes from degradation of forests. Climate change comes from melting of glaciers. Climate change comes from degradation of mountains. Degradation of mankind is what has led to this. So there is enough for sustenance. There is enough for the need, but there is not enough for the greed. And it is the greed of mankind which is leading us to these devastating impacts. And these devastating impacts, if needs to be corrected, then the correction has to be in the thought process. And correction in the thought process can only come, it's not through multi-million business and environment. It is not the superficial outlook towards environment. It is the spiritual outlook which can change the way we think. It is that spirituality which has to make us one with the nature. The moment we start thinking, the moment we start thinking, 
that Ganga is my mother, will I be polluting it? Will I be defecating in it? Ganga as a river is all sustaining. When you look at the Indian civilization, the Hindu civilization, the UP culture, you look at anything, it's the Ganga which is the pathway which has taken, which has made the entire civilization on its banks. So when we look at Ganges, we know that it is the cultural, it is the spiritual, it is the economic life stream of this country. And amount of wrong we have done to it. Look at the amount of wrong over the years we have done to it. Look at the way we have degraded forests around it. Look at the way we have not managed its resources well. And when I look at my ancient philosophy, I feel the more approach of the other world, which I call the Western world as a singular sentence, the more I think about it, the more I feel the nature of religious thought has been more anthropomorphic. Because anthropomorphic is based on human beings, man, 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 man. But the thought here is that this life, this earth is not only meant for mankind. This life, this earth is meant for all species. This earth is meant for all innate and innate objects. This life is meant for mountains, rivers, sand, everything needs to be respected and treated with dignity. And the moment we start treating all these aspects with dignity, only then can we have sustainable development goals success. If we want sustainable development goals, SDGs to succeed, then we need to have a different approach. And that different approach is by making environment part of our life, by giving dignity to every life form, by giving dignity to all animate and inanimate object. A speck of carbon in the earth can tomorrow be an earthworm because it is that speck of carbon which gets converted into life. That hydrogen mixes with water, produces water. And that water is 70% of you and me. And if we look at the connection, the life cycle, and in that life cycle, the way Hindu ethos and thoughts have progressed is by telling each one of us that the soul, the Atma, is no different in a man or a calf or a cow or a snake or a lizard or a lion. The Atma is the same. And each one of us could be that tomorrow. And with that thought, you learn to respect and treat animals with dignity. And when we look at animals, look at the way our thought process was made, that each animal is a vahan of some deity. And each deity is to be recognized by the vahan. And when each deity is recognized by the vahan, you learn to respect. And that particular animal is respected not only as a vahan, because that vahan at times is shown to be through thought, through stories, through uh, narratives, that that Vahan is a companion, that Vahan is a friend, that Vahan is carrying messages, that Vahan is telling stories. And with the result, you learn to respect that Vishnu ka Vahan Garur hai. And that Garur becomes venerable because it's Vishnu's uh, uh, ca carrier. That mouse becomes the vehicle of Ganesh. So you learn to respect both elephant and the mouse. And imagine the largest number of elephants are found in this country, whereas elephants across the world have diminished. How has that happened? We have 3,000 plus types of groups of people. We have the largest number of languages. We have the highest number of biodiversity in terms of plants and animals. All this has happened, not because there was any environmental movement in this country. There have been some small movements, but it is the dharmic thought which has protected the species. It is the sense of integral humanism which has protected the environment, and it is this thought which the world needs to be guided with. It is this thought which can change the way humanity progresses ahead, and it is this thought which I'm here to propagate. I thought that somebody needs to understand what we believe in, 
Somebody needs to know how our ethos come from, how our civilization has managed to work through the difficult times, how we have managed to live through all kinds of wrongs which humanity can think of. All this has been a sustaining experience because we believed in nature. Even today, when we start thinking, the anthropomorphic form of mankind is what is worshipped and nurtured. That this place is venerable because Mother Mary appeared here. This place is venerable because Alaksa Mosque is there, which is also related to mankind, a huma human aspect of the civilization. Wailing Wall is important because, again, man is visiting that. Whereas here, you go to Amarnath because there is a snow shivling. You go to Kailash Mansarovar because it's the abode of Shiva. You go to Vishnu Devi, it's high up in the mountains, a Durga appeared. You go to Gangotri, you go to Yamnotri, you go to Haridwar, you go to Banaras. So because it's by the side of Ganges and you do Ganga Arti. All these rituals, all these are manifestation of our faith in the godliness of the inanimate objects, which other consider inanimate, we feel they have the conscience. You go to Ponta Sahib, you go to Harminder Sahib, even man-made lakes and rivers are to be venerated because we believe water conservation is the most important aspect if mankind needs to survive. I personally feel that the ancient ethos, the ancient wisdom, the aspect of sacrament is part of religious belief and there are two aspects to it. One, one is the ideological aspect, the other is the sacramental aspect. The ideological aspect is different layer of mankind's existence, a different layer of our existence and one part of that layer is ecology. And the moment we start looking at the questions which mankind is facing generally is on the basis of ecology. And we start looking at religious aspects. You look at the trees of this country. Tree in the other sides of the world is a natural object. And that nature has produced. Whereas here, the trees are sacred objects. And spirituality is connected directly to the trees. You look at the trees. The tree comes first, the temple comes later. And with every tree, there is a deity. And that deity, because of that deity, because you have to use pan as an offering to the goddess, you must preserve pan. 